the forces which erode us, the forces which erode rocks on the Earth don't exist on Venus. The principal reason that rocks are eroded on the Earth is because of running water. The surface of Venus is much too hot to have any liquid water at all. Another thing which erodes rocks on the Earth is windblown dust. But we know, both from theory and from direct observation, that the winds at the surface of Venus are very slow, even though they're very fast in the high atmosphere, and not enough to move dust. What, then, is rubbing down the rocks of Venus? It is a mystery. Two ideas which have been proposed are the terrible acids in the atmosphere, which may be slowly eating away the rocks. Or it may be that the high surface temperature melts some low melting point component of the rocks, and so there is a slow change in shape of the rocks, a smoothing out as time goes on. Well, we don't yet have many pictures of the surface of Venus taken close up, but it may be that sometime in the next five or ten years we will have views like this artist's conception um, of what the surface of Venus may be like. It may be very different from this as well. We are in the earliest stages of exploration. Now, the older astronomers not only proposed that Venus was a kind of swamp, some proposed that it was a vast desert like the Sahara. Some proposed that it was an ocean of uh, carbonated water. And some proposed that it was a vast planetary oil field. The fact that four such different ideas could all be held on the basis of the same data shows the enterprise of the astronomers uh, in the absence of supporting evidence. We now have a good idea what Venus is like. It's not like the Earth. The analogy of the Earth uh, was with us from the beginning because Venus is the same size and mass and approximate position in the solar system as the Earth. But Venus is a very different place. Now, these warnings are important when we start to study Mars because Mars has also been thought to be a place in many respects like the Earth that we have placed our hopes and fantasies, wishes and desires on. And we must be cautious that our wishes do not blind us to the reality of a planet. Now, exactly a century ago, in 1877, two discoveries were announced about Mars, which will dominate the rest of this talk. One is the announcement that there were canals on Mars, and the other, the announcement that two moons had been discovered going around Mars. Now, if we look at Mars through a telescope, we do not see a crisp, sharp, lovely image. We see a blob of a few colors which is changing its shape. It isn't even circular. Sometimes you see a little blob piece breaks off, see, as if Mars is dividing up. And you're lucky if you can see the polar cap, if the polar cap is, is, is visible. You're lucky if you can see any surface features. Mars is often a disappointment to the amateur astronomer looking at it for the first time. Where are all the features I've read about? I can't see any of them. The reason has to do with the Earth's atmosphere. The Earth's atmosphere is turbulent. It moves, and light which passes through it is bent. And it's a little bit like uh, if you're having breakfast in the morning and there's a toaster between you and, uh, let's say, your brother or sister. You're looking at the face of your brother and sis or sister, and suddenly the ear seems to waft off into space. <laughs> the reason fortunately, is not that there's anything wrong with your sibling's ear, but that the hot air rising from the toaster is distorting your view. And that's exactly what we have to deal with in looking at planets from the surface of the Earth, and is an excellent reason to get above the atmosphere of the Earth. But the observers of the last century were stuck on Earth, as we no longer are. And let me try to show you the problems which they had to deal with. 
we have here a modern map of Mars showing much more detail than the 19th century observers knew about, and a container of water above it. Uh, it's going to be illuminated from below and reflected in this mirror and go into the television camera. Meanwhile, Mr. Coates and I are going to dip our fingers in the water and uh, make irregular waves. And the cameraman has defocused his camera. And this gives a faint sense of what Mars looks like through the telescope under ordinary seeing conditions with a reasonably good telescope. Uh, maybe now the cameraman can focus up just a little bit and occasionally an improvement more detail for just a moment you can see something like this and then the Earth's atmosphere unsteadies the image becomes less well focused and the problem of the 19th century observer was to draw what he saw if we could focus up again I just can't resist doing this ah. okay now thank you that was the problem. There was something to be seen, but only in fleeting glimpses, unpredictable glimpses. You couldn't photograph it because you couldn't tell the camera when to take the picture because you didn't know when the atmosphere would be steady. The eye could remember when the atmosphere was steady, but the eye is not a perfect recording instrument. The best that can be seen by photography from the surface of the Earth is shown by pictures like this. Now, I'm going to show two photographs of Mars, and there are two features which I would like to show you, I'd like to call your attention to. I will later in this talk and in the next talk show what they are. In this picture, the dark feature at the very center is the darkest feature on Mars, and it is called Sirtis Major. We see that Mars has bright areas, it has dark areas, it has a polar cap made of some kind of snow. We know that the cap waxes and wanes with the seasons. There are occasional clouds. There's one here and one over here. It is a planet about half the size of the Earth. If we follow a certain feature, let's say this one, and see how long it takes for it to reappear as the planet rotates, we can find out what the length of the day is on Mars, and astonishingly, it's about 24 hours, just like here. The planet's about half the size of the Earth, so it has about a quarter the surface area, because the area is 4 pi r squared, as everyone in the audience surely knows, for a circle, for a sphere. And that's roughly comparable to the land area of the Earth. So even though Mars is smaller than the Earth, it is a big place for exploration. Things change, we see clouds, we see the polar caps change, and uh, it's a reasonable place to think about what's the ground like? What's the atmosphere like? Could there be life? How did the planet come to be? Is it as old as the Earth? Questions which are difficult to approach if we are limited to this kind of detail. Here, the feature I'd like to call your attention to is this one right here called Solus Lacus, the lake of the sun. The people who named these features were very good at Greek and Latin, um, and those of us not so good at Greek and Latin have to struggle with the names. Now, these are photographs, but as I mentioned, much more detail can be obtained from drawings. Here now is a drawing of this same region, Solus Lacus, by a 19th and early 20th century observer named Antoniadi. And here we have, again, the Solus Lacus region, but much more detail in this picture. We see all sorts of little circles, and we see some hint of irregular, almost straight lines in this picture, but not lots of them. Also, we see coloration, a sort of blue-purple to the dark areas, which we did not see in the previous uh, photographs. Now, this same region was observed by others who saw